the door gate that part of the wiring loom when it was uh, firstly being built. We left the wiring loom in the car, ready to be put in. And we came back to the day after, and the dog decided to chew through it all. The dog's still living, by the way. Oh dear. Mm. My name's John Rostall. Um, I'm from Oldham. The car is a 1.8 20 valve turbo, uh, 1983. It was originally black. It was in decent condition, to be fair, when I got it. Got it from Scotland. Got the engine from London. And that's when it all started. I uh, started driving on the farm at about eight years old, driving tractors. Uh, my parents had a working farm, quite a big one, 80 acre farm, so basically I had to drive as a kid. So I started driving tractors, then I got my first car when I was about 14 years old. I used to drive it around the farm, drive it in the fields, play around and cause havoc like you do as a kid. And then I bought, I bought a Mini off um, an old gentleman that was uh, uh, finished driving. I bought the car off him, it was a little Mini Cooper. So that was the first car that I'd ever had on the road. And from there on, it was just Fords as usual, like everybody normally has. And then I bit the bullet and went for a Golf back in 2000. And never looked back since, really. Basically, a friend of mine, we wanted to do a project. When he said he wanted to do a Mark 1, I just said, have you got a deep pocket? And he just laughed at me. Anyway, six months later, into the build, ended up owning the car. It was approximately nine years um, from when I actually got the car off my friend. Working on it as much as I could, the best as I could. It's quite hard, you're working long hours, you're coming home, you're working till two or three o'clock in the morning sometimes to try and get things done. They end up taking a step back. You end up thinking it's never gonna get done. That's a problem with some of these jobs. You know, it's such a big, big thing to take on. I didn't even realize myself, to be fair, how big it was. And after the years rolled on, my wife kept turning around saying, you're not going in the garage doing a bit more, you're not going doing a bit more. Anyway, cut long story short, it was hard work. Three o'clock, you know, three o'clock in the morning, falling asleep in the engine bay. It was hard. The exterior, it was quite an awkward one because we never knew what colour it was going to be. And the exterior was never really on my mind. It was more, it was going to be a short car to start with. This is why all the engine bay is smooth. And that was the start of the project. So the exterior was really the last sort of thing. And I never really knew what I wanted until I saw uh, a Ford Focus, which was matte black, and started thinking about doing the matte exterior. And then grey always looks quite an expensive colour on a car. It doesn't really seem to matter what car it is. So we thought grey would be a good, good colour to go for. Uh, and then the matte, it just ended up lovely colour matte. And it was painted in here by a, an amateur, me, and it turned out reasonably well. So quite pleased with that. The carbon fibre roof, um, it was put on because the sunroof was quite rotten. And to try and weld the sunroof, they warp terribly the roofs. So we just binned it and the carbon fibre roof got put on there, which was quite a daunting project because you've got to cut the whole roof out and leave about 35, 40 mil on for it to get bonded to. So it was very, very daunting. And then it just seemed to escalate from there. It was a case of, well, we've got a carbon fibre roof, might as well go for the bonnet and the tailgate. So that's when the bonnet and the tailgate came along. It was quite a, a long trip to go and get it down at Hailing Island, transit van, got down there, middle of the night, fell asleep in the uh, port in the harbour, woke up in the morning, picked the parts up and drove back home. Slept in the back of the transit, on the night of down and that was it. 
So the exterior, it carried on from there. So it went more of a racy sort of look. And then the bumpers came last because I wasn't really having bumpers and I wasn't gonna ever have them. But it, I don't think it looked finished. So I ended up getting the carbon fiber bumpers which finished the car off quite well. It's wide arched, I've done them all out with steel. There's no um, filler in there at all. It's all been done with lead. You heat it up and you smooth it all in and it covers all the holes up, any imperfections and stuff like that. Then you have to rub it all down. It's quite a really hard process to do, to be fair. I wasn't really good at it to start with, but ended up doing a reasonable job when I finished. Basically, they are half original and then the other half is an extension of um, original wing itself. So you weld, you do a butt weld all the way around. That was to accommodate the wheels. I'd always wanted those kind of wheels, so I had to make the arches accommodate the wheels. So that's really the exterior. The interior. We went for the race look, of course. Uh, I was started with a dash. I was grafting the Audi TT dash into the original Mark 1 dash, which looked quite well and it flowed, flowed in quite well. But when I put the roll cage in, I ended up having to cut the dashboard and it didn't look right at all. It looked like a complete afterthought. Not only that, the, the roll cage didn't really come up to the uh, bulkhead properly so I could weld it to it to make it stronger. And then when I come to put the dash back in that way, it didn't really work neither. So I ended up bending the dash, which ended up with nowhere to put switches. So that's when I ended up making the center console the way it is uh, to house all the switches. Then it ended up becoming more looking like a rally car. So after that, it was a case of, well, it's will have to complement it with something. So it ended up having two bucket seats in and, and, and it can't put back seats in because it's got a roll cage there. So it ended up basically a stripped out car after all this. I was actually going to get it all done in leather and make it a show car, but it just never happened that way. So basically it just evolved from one thing to another. It's just one of those things that snowballs. You'd never really think uh, of what you're actually going to do. I never even thought it'd turn out like this at all. If you'd have asked me nine years ago, what is your car going to look like? It would have been nothing like this at all. It just evolved, things change. You get a different view on the scene. And it just went from there. The engine, it's uh, an early Audi S3, which is a 210 brake horse one. It's not really much different than the BAM engine. The wrist pins in the uh, Conrods are a different size, that's all. And it's just basically a map on the car. Uh, it's a 2001 engine, one of the early ones. Uh, they're really not much different throughout the whole uh, range with the Golf or the Audis. They're all the same, 180 engines. Pretty bulletproof to be fair. It's running uh, a Q-Peng ECU, which is running approximately 270 brake horse. It's all right through the front wheels. It's got a limited slip diff in, so it keeps it reasonably down. It's not brilliant. In a wet day, it's shocking. It's all over the place. It's nearly uncontrollable sometimes. It's like we're hitting a white line. It just ends up following the white line. You get the wagon ruts on the motorway. It's, it's a bit all over the place. With the power it's got, it's all right as it is, but I want more power. I've got a bigger turbo. I've got manifold injectors waiting to go on. It's just time as usual. And the other thing I want to do is foil drive it because obviously I want more power. So to get the power down, I need to you know, foil drive it really. So the car's future plans is um, approximately 450 brake horse, which will be absolutely perfectly fine for a small car like this. It weighs at the moment uh, 760 kilos last time I weighed it, which is quite light with just short of 300 brake horse. So once it's foil drive, Hopefully I'll be happy, I can have the paint done properly and finish it off and I'll be that done then, I hope. The biggest achievement was actually finishing it because I never ever thought it was going to be finished. I actually got to a point a few times where I turned around to my wife and said, I'm going to sell it. Why are you selling it? I'm just never going to finish it. And then it just seemed to 
gradually come on really quickly. Um, but yeah, the achievement was actually finishing the car and getting it out. The biggest difficulty was probably getting the engine straight. It needs to lean back at 15 degrees. And with not having any engine mounts off the shelf to go off, it was basically put the engine in there uh, and hold it up on the top mounts to put the weight on the bodywork and then make mounts as you could and go from there. That was really challenging. The engine mounts are all handmade of course because there was nothing back then so it was a basically make a template up, put it on, see if it sat right, if it didn't make another one. There's several, several engine mounts later, you know, you, you finally got it right. That was quite difficult to be fair. Is it special? You tell me. It's all right, I don't see it that way. I don't see it as being special because as you're building something, it's just a car that you've built really. If, if, if I'd seen it somewhere else, I'd go, wow, like probably else, else probably does, you, know, you think it's special, but I think because you've actually built it yourself, you don't see it that way. I just see it as a, a car with some fancy bits on it, I suppose, really. It's quite heavy on the steering, uh, low speed. It's a bit awkward to handle. Even though it's so small, it's, um, it's very, very twitchy. It tends to go where it feels like sometimes. So this compared to a normal car, um, it's a bit awkward. But it's quite fun as well, to be honest. Uh, so it's, when you get to probably 70 mile an hour on the motorway, with it being about as aerodynamic as a barn door, it tends to not be very nice after probably 70 mile an hour or so. But it's nice to drive, to be fair. It's not bad. It'll sit on the motorway at 65, 70, and it'll cruise at that, and it'll be quite economical to be fair. We probably averaged about 45 miles to the gallon. So it, as long as you don't press the throttle too much, it uh, stays there, not bad. I drive it as often as I can. Every time it's decent weather, try and get out in it, we'll do probably any between 70 and 150 mile in a day. We'll go up in Cumbria, we'll go all decent bike roads, have a nice run out. So yeah, we we'll use it as much as we can in summer. I've got insured for 3,000 mile a year. Last year it was insured for 1,500 mile. We actually hit into 1,500 mile last year, dead on. And we said we'll do it for 3,000 and keep the insurance company happy. Uh, most proud of, probably people appreciating it really. It's a nice feeling when people come up to you and they say, it's a nice finish, it looks well, decent finished engine bay and it looks well, even though it isn't finished. The car's never finished really, but it was brought out too early to be fair. It was brought out obviously with my daughter's prom, but if it had been finished the way it should have been finished, it would have been painted by somebody else who can paint properly, and it wouldn't look, you know, it could look obviously more finished off than it really is now. And it's a nice achievement when people appreciate something you've done. With this one, um, if, I, if I got another Mark 1, I would definitely not do it again the same way as this. It would be a lot more subtle. Um, I am going to do it again. I've got a Mark 2 which is partly done and it doesn't need much to finish it, he says. And won't cost a fortune like this one has. So hopefully the Mark 2 I'm hoping will be started uh, in a few months time when I can get this put another place out of the way nice and safe. So yeah, definitely Mark II's next. Any sad stories? Um, only really thinking about selling it after all has been put into it. Funny stories, uh, the door gate, the part of the wiring loom, when it was uh, firstly being built, we'd left the wiring loom in the car, ready to be put in to see if it was right length, because we were changing it, because the connectors were all shocking and terrible and had to be all done. So I put the new wiring loom back in the car and we came back to it the day after and the dog decided to chew through it all. So I ended up having to solder it all and re-piece it all back together. That was a quite a highlight. The dog's still living by the way. Oh, 
idea. Parts, um, very easy to get to be fair. Uh, the companies are all online and deliver very easy, so the parts are very easy to get hold of. I have a friend who has a, a breaker's yard, let's me just run around his yard and just pull bits off and come and try them on the car, see if they're any good and then no good, give them to him back or if I want them, I'll pay for them. So lucky really. Yeah, I'd say quite a large thanks to me mum and dad for the support, dad especially because of his brains, it's rubbed off on me I suppose, wife for uh, being the bank manager, pretty appreciate that, uh, I've got a friend called Steve, he owns the uh, salvage yard, uh, he runs it with a friend of his called Adam, uh, I'd like to thank them as well for rummaging around the yard at any time I want to, that's quite nice, yeah thank you very much for everybody else.